Welcome everyone to our Wednesday devotional. We are glad that you are with us this evening. We are going to be in 1 Kings chapter 14. If you would like to turn your Bibles there, 1 Kings chapter 14 as you're getting all settled in for our study and our devotional time. I'd like to say uh, welcome. We are glad that you are here with us. You have an open invitation to worship with us at 2201 Hickory Avenue with the Hickory Knoll Church of Christ. We uh, meet every Sunday for worship at 9 a.m. We have children and adult Bible classes at 10, 15 a.m. And if you have any Spanish-speaking friends, there's also Spanish-speaking Bible classes and a Spanish-speaking worship service uh, beginning around 11, 15 or so on Sunday mornings. For the last uh, several Wednesdays, we have been looking at various uh, big events uh, in the Old Testament, and we've talked recently about the the demise, the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel, and uh, today, and Lord willing, next time, we're going to spend some, uh, f have some focus on some of the things that were going on in the southern kingdom uh, of Judah as well. As you know, the God's people were initially all united under the kingship uh, originally of Saul and then David and then Solomon and uh, and then uh, because of the people's unfaithfulness including Solomon's uh, the, the kingdom was divided 10 northern tribes of Israel two southern tribes of Judah and our our focus today is on some of the things going on in the southern kingdom of Judah. With all of that said, I'm in 1 Kings chapter 14, beginning in verse 21, and we'll go down to verse 31 and make some comments and uh, along the way as well. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. I, just a random memory here. This has nothing to do with, with any real significance, but I always, I always trying to remember the difference between Rehoboam and Jeroboam and Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south, and uh, just random memory. I uh, have, remember taking a, an exam at, at Harding and uh, an Old Testament survey and, and you know, those pneumatic devices, right? So I, um, Jeroboam in the north, J.N. Armstrong, that was a president at Harding uh, way back in the day, and my little brother is Ryan Joseph. So J.N., Jeroboam north, Ryan Joseph, <laughs> Rehoboam, Judah in the south. So if that works for you, it works for me. So I, I always remember Jeroboam in the north, uh, Rehoboam uh, in the in the south. But nonetheless, Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king. I'll be 41 later this year uh, in October. And, and so uh, Rehoboam was right there in middle adulthood, give or take a year or two. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. You know, Jerusalem is the uh, the head area, if you will. The, uh, the temple uh, was built there. Uh, the uh, worship, uh, as far as the Levitical priests and uh, all of those items, uh, Jerusalem was uh, certainly uh, the place that the Lord had, uh, had chosen. And as and the scripture says in verse 22, Now Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they committed more than all their fathers had done. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is a holy God. He's a merciful God. He's a loving God. But our God is a jealous God as well. Now, I don't want you to think of God's jealousy on the same playing field as the, the type of jealousy we kind of uh, have as humans uh, from time to time in our lives. But initially, it may seem a bit counterintuitive to think about the Lord being provoked to jealousy. But it's the understanding that God wants us to be faithful. And he takes, in a sense, he takes it personal when we're not. I mean, he did everything for us. He has created us. He's loved us. He, through Christ, has saved us. And um, there isn't anything he hasn't done uh, for us. 
And he wants us to be saved. He desires for us to come to repentance. He does not want us to be lost. But sin and the evil associated with it is very disturbing to the Lord. And uh, something that hopefully we can uh, repent of as necessary in pursuing uh, those things that are good and right as opposed to those things that are sinful and evil. God's people were doing all kinds of things for they also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars and wooden images on every hill and under every green tree. This stuff, this pagan worship, this idolatrous idolatry, it was everywhere. Verse 24, and there were also perverted persons in the land. And that's the idea of a pervert. That's disgusting. It's disturbing. It's uh, it's gross. And uh, it's something that uh, just uh, creeps you out uh, to even think about it. And and as you think about many um, many victims, um, and including uh, innocent children, uh, there's perverts everywhere. And they were perverts back then as well. They did according to all the abominations of which the Lord, of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. It happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, <laughs> king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away all the gold shields which Solomon had made. Uh, Egypt for a while had lost its power and strength and they were, um, they were building themselves back up. And at this point in history, they were at the, had the ability to go in and, and take everything. And it wasn't so much though the strength of Egypt as much as it was the, the punishment from the Lord. So King Rehoboam made bronze shields in their place and committed them to the hands of the captains of the guard who guarded the doorway of the king's house. And whenever the king entered the house of the Lord, the guards carried them, then brought them back into the guard room. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam, all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war, verse 30, between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. So Rehoboam rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Naamah the Ammonite. Then Abijam, his son, reigned in his place. Why did there have to be war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all of their days? I don't know. Um, it did have to be that way. Uh, but uh, when you live a life of idolatry, when you live a life of pagan worship, when you live a life of evil, when you lead a life full of sin, you're going to be in conflict with a lot of people a lot of the time. And But the Lord's way is peaceful. The Lord's way is righteous. When we choose faithfulness, when we choose obedience, then we're going to experience that peace, as Paul writes in Philippians 4, that peace that passes all understanding. But when we choose evil and sinfulness, we're going to be at war with each other, and we're going to be at war and in battle and in conflicts all of the time. Now, what's interesting, I came across a, a piece of uh, archaeological uh, uh, significance. I, I'm not uh, one who, certainly not an expert in archaeology, but uh, there was a um, there was a a fragment at this place called. And if any of you have any interest, just call or text me, and I'll give you the spelling on this. And you might want to chase this rabbit. It's fascinating. There was a fra an archaeological fragment that was. Uh, discovered in southern Israel at the site uh, at a site called Kuntelet Ajrud, <laughs> uh, and uh, they 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 found this. Uh, there was this discovery, this fragment of 
of pictures of, of a bull-like god and an, ex, and an inscription on it. And there was some um, perverted uh, type items, uh, some sexual symbolism. Uh, one of them labeled uh, Yahweh of Samaria. Yahweh being, you know, the name of the Lord. Okay. Um, and then there was another inscription that uh, was Asherar of the Yahweh of Samaria. Now, you may be thinking, Eric, what in the world are you telling us about the Asherar of the Yahweh of Samaria? Well, evidently, there was some, there was some idolatry going on. And, and, and so they, they were combining um, elements of God, if you will, with elements of this, this pagan God. The Asherah, of course, uh, connected to um, uh, this Baal worship, uh, this female deity, uh, and uh, a lot of immorality, a lot of perversion, um, a, a lot of sin. Okay, but it's interesting that the people, that the inscription said, Asherah of the Yahweh of Samaria. It, it, the point is, the people, God's people... They didn't abandon the Lord completely. They just didn't follow him all the way. It, they, they believed in the one true God of Israel. But they also believed in pagan gods as well. And, and so it was kind of like a, a pick and choose type religion. It was a, a mix and match type religion. They wanted to, to hang on on some of the Yahweh things, but they wanted to combine the, the Asherah things as well. It's been said that it's a whole lot easier to change our image of God than it is to change our own lives. Instead of reflecting upon our on what God's Word says and reflecting upon our lives and making those tough hard changes in our own life through repentance, through obedience, through faithfulness, to live in accordance with God's will, with his word, we don't want to change. And so instead of changing our lives, instead of repenting of sin, what we want to do is have a little Ashrar of the Yahweh of Samaria in our own lives. We want a little bit of the Lord, but we want a little bit of materialism. We want a little bit of idolatry. We want a little bit of, uh, of paganism. We want a little bit of sin in our lives. And instead of focusing on changing ourselves, we change our perception of God to make ourselves feel better, to have less guilt and less shame. But that's not fooling anyone. It's certainly not, f it, well, it may fool a few, but it, it's not fooling my uh, God, uh, we want to be all in. What's the greatest commands? To love the Lord your God with all of your hearts, your mind, soul, and strength. There's a lot of people in this world who they haven't abandoned God completely, but they haven't followed him completely either. It's uh, We need to be all in. We need to make sure that God is number one in our life. And instead of trying to pick and choose or mix and match of what we want to do as far as righteousness and unrighteousness and trying to uh, justify that in our own minds, we don't want to be the, have this Asherah of the Yahweh of Samaria approach. We just want the Lord, the Yahweh, the true Yahweh, the true Lord of, of Israel. And when we follow his will... When we do what he says, we will have peace in our lives. We'll see that we're, our conflicts, our wars, our battles with others, uh, they're going to subside quite a bit as we live peaceful lives, serving our Savior, worshiping him in spirit and in truth, and doing his will as he has given it to us. I hope this has been helpful to you. We look forward to being with you next time. Take care and God bless.